everybody, welcome to Carpool Chats. I'm John Eichberger with the Fuels Institute, and today we're going to be talking about something that's on everybody's mind. You know, when we think about the transition to electric vehicles, one of the critical elements is access to charging infrastructure. Um, if you've been paying attention to anything in the automotive industry at any point in your life, the name J.D. Power is definitely something familiar with you. Uh, and today we're joined by Brent Gruber, who's the Senior Director of Global Automotive. And Brent, you guys recently just published your inaugural U.S. Electric Vehicle Experience Public Charging Study, right? Yeah, that's right, John. Thanks for having me on the show. Uh, uh, so, yeah, we, we just released our public charging study last month. Um, it was actually the last of five new studies that we introduced this year, everything from consideration, so people who are in the market and considering electric vehicles, uh, up and through the ownership experience, all the different aspects of owning an electric vehicle, which obviously include, includes charging. And so, uh, you know, we developed a study specific to the public charging experience because it's so unique to, to uh, you know, own EV ownership. Yeah, yeah, we launched an electric vehicle council last year that's laser focused on infrastructure. We've done yeah. publications on the regulations affecting installation operation, how to get into the business, if you want to be a site host, consumer behavior. Um, and I think one of the things that when we talk about the transition to electric vehicles, one of the key elements that seems to be missing is the consumer decision factor. Mm -hmm. What are you guys learning in the studies you guys have been doing about the consumer behavior and what they're looking for? Yeah, well, this is something we've actually been doing for a while. So I mentioned that these five new studies we have that we released this year was really the culmination of some work that we had done in recent years, which, you know, indicated a lot of the, you know, the typical findings that you hear in the media, range anxiety, you know, um, uh, you know, charging, uh, bat charging the vehicles, um, you know, locations for public chargers, you know, all of those kinds of things and how fast it is to charge. So, you know, we, we had a sense for, you know, Know, what the consumer sentiment was, um, but really develop these studies to go in more detail on, on just that. And so, you know, when we talk about what consumers are looking for, what consumers want, you know, it's very much those things. They very much want uh, a long battery range. You know, they want the, the vehicle to uh, have a long range. You know, they want the fast charge. They want uh, charging stations to be as ubiquitous as, uh, you know, gas stations. So, you know, th those are really at, at the core of what consumers are looking for. But I think what we found is that there's a lot of tangibles that go along with that that make EV ownership much better um, along the way. You know, I've always said that the three C's to EV adoption, it's choice cost and charging and mm -hmm. choice is getting we're gonna have so many more vehicles come to the market so your options are there they're being offered in crossover utility vehicles now which is what almost everybody wants to mm -hmm. buy anyway the costs are coming down but that charging infrastructure and i think you know the administration wants to get half a million chargers by the end of the decade we're trying to figure out the right number what's the right number when where what type of charger but i really believe that the the calculation that's being used is how many chargers you need to satisfy demand mm -hmm. In order to satisfy the consumer concern for access to charging, it's going to be an exponentially higher number than what we can calculate it out. Do you is that something you guys have seen? Yeah, it, it is, and you know, I, I think there's a problem. Uh, there's an inherent problem there. Um, you know, first and foremost, I think one thing that's oftentimes overlooked is the um, uh, the importance of charging at home. Right. So when we talk about building public charging infrastructure and the amount of money that's being invested in that space, that's all great and well. But 85 percent of primary electric vehicle charging occurs at home. And so the public charging infrastructure and the need to rely on that is, is really, you know, for those folks who don't have easy access to home charging, you know, maybe they live in a multi-unit dwelling or in an urban environment where they can't install a charging station. So it's for those folks. And then it's for people who are, you know, utilizing it out of convenience. When we talk about public charging, there's really sort of two different tracks. There are those people who are utilizing it you know, on a road trip. So going to grandma's house for Thanksgiving and they need to charge along the way. And then those people who are, you know, just driving around town and taking advantage of uh, charging stations nearby. So when you look at it in that context, and again, you take the amount of money that's being invested in the space, you know, I, I really strongly feel that, um, you know, we should do what we can to support the ease of charging at home and facilitate that because I think that would put a lot less stress on the need to build out the public infrastructure, which is absolutely needed, uh, but not nearly to the extent that good home charging is. 
Yeah, and I think you know right now, clearly, the majority of the people own an EV, and it's only about one and a half percent of the market um, have access to a home charging. The majority of them, you know, they're mm-hmm. they have they're single family homes with a garage, so it's not a big issue for right. them. I think when we start getting to mass adoption, if we're going to get to a point where 30, 40 percent of new vehicle sales are going to be EV. You're going to get into a very different demographic. And I think the profile of the driver is going to normalize and the number of people living in multi-unit dwellings is going to increase. And they're not, they're not always going to have access to charging. So I think mm-hmm. you know, we're trying to build it up now to satisfy that need. The challenge we run into from a business perspective is to invest in a charging station today when the vast majority of charging is done at home, demand for in-market charging is low, it's really hard to justify that ROI. Um, mm-hmm. When you guys looked at the consumer sentiment, I mean, where do you see the needs and, and the opportunities here to actually build an infrastructure that will be viable today, but also satisfy the needs of the market in the future? Yeah, well, I, I think, you know, first and foremost, one thing that came through loud and clear with the research we did was the the convenience factor. Um, you know, when you're talking about public charging, um, you know, right now it's largely done based on convenience. So, you know, you're you're driving home from work, you're stopping at the grocery store to pick up some groceries, and there's a charging station there, so you charge because it's convenient. So, you know, when we talk about it like that, it's that convenience factor that's really driving a lot of this, and that's what you know consumers are looking for. So, the behaviors that we see with public charging and the levels of satisfaction that are um, um, you know, uh, responding well to public charging is those that have a convenient experience with things to do nearby. That was one of the, the top findings, uh, you know, the level of amenities nearby when someone's charging. You know, I can't tell you how many responses we saw from uh, you know, survey takers who were indicating that, uh, you know, the charging station they were at was in the middle of nowhere and there was nothing to do while they were charging. Right. right. So having, you know, restaurants nearby, shopping, those kinds of things, that's really going to be key to adding that convenience factor. Now, you also found something about downtime and we've talked about resiliency. And you know, these are fairly new technology, the chargers mm-hmm. and stuff. Um, other than the proximity uh, activities, what are the other things we're looking for? Obviously, they want the charger to be operational, but what are the other things that we need to really be thinking about to make sure we're satisfying their needs? So yeah, downtime is is really critical. And I, I think you hit on something a few moments ago. You know, right now we're looking at a very small percentage of the market um, uh, for EVs. You know, we're, we're right around 3% for battery electric vehicles for U.S. retail share right now. But we're, we're planning for that, that uptick. You know, we're planning for that mass market adoption. And, you know, that's where we're going to start to see some of those problems. So when you talk about downtime with charging stations, you know, it may not be problematic now, but when you have, like you said, 30, 40 percent of consumers who are utilizing charging stations, it becomes much more problematic. So right now we're, we have a challenge where there's a race to build infrastructure and put new charging stations in. And, you know, there's almost a little bit of neglect with some of the older stations. So some of these things fall to the responsibility of the site host and they can fall into states of disrepair. And so, you know, we're not doing a good enough job of, of maintaining or managing the existing charging uh, stations that exist. And that's going to become much more problematic when we hit that adoption curve. It takes me to another thought is you guys look at the automotive industry all the time. Um, and one of the concerns that's been expressed to some potential site hosts is, okay, I'm going to invest in a charger today. The technology is going to evolve so much Mm -hmm. over the next five to 10 years. By the time we get to mass adoption of the vehicles, what power charger do I need to satisfy the needs of the market? You hear people say you need 350 kilowatt chargers. Right now, there's only one vehicle can charge at 350 kilowatts. So do we need to build 350 kilowatt capacity or is 150 kilowatt capacity or 50 kilowatt capacity? I mean, what did, what do you guys see as the, the glide path and technology and where, where do we need to be building? You know, we talk about you skate to the puck at a hockey metaphor. Where do we need to be skating so that we intercept the puck at the right time? Mm-hmm. Yeah, I think it really works backwards from the amount of time that people are willing to sit there and, and charge. Um, you know, right now, when you ask someone, you know, what, what their expectations are for charge time, um, you know, it's based on their uh, experiences with ICE vehicles. So, you know, how long does it take to f- fill up a gas tank on an ICE vehicle, right? That's sort of the expectation for the charge time. So when you work backwards from what that consumer expectation is, you know, because you have to do it in a way where 
people don't want to drastically change their behaviors. So, you know, if it's if it's a charge, it's going to have to be a similar level of time to maintain um, satisfaction or not hurt satisfaction. And so working backwards from that, that fill up time, if you will, um, you know, is really going to dictate what we need from a technology standpoint. And, and you made a great point. And that's, you know, the fact that we have these, um, you know, uh, these high powered charging stations, these ultra fast charging stations, but, you know, there's limitations with the vehicles. And so I think that's one thing that's oftentimes overlooked that it's, um, you know, responsibility, not responsibility, but it's, um, you know, a, a byproduct of the vehicle itself, as well as the charging station. And those two have to work together to optimize that charge. And so, you know, just going out and putting the fastest chargers out there we can um, isn't necessarily going to help with where products are right now and the ability to accept that charge. So I think we have to be realistic with those charging stations and the capacities um, and shoot for a time rather than a, a, a speed or a, a level, if you will. Yeah, and I think, you know, the fact that the charger and the vehicle have to work together and that influences charge time, something a lot of people don't get. You see all these charts saying a level right. two at this rate can charge this many miles, a DC fast charge at 150. It all depends on the vehicle. Um, and so they're mm -hmm. nice little uh, talking points, but they're not reality and they're not, they're not yeah. what you can plan on. Um, but I also think, you know, you mentioned about the desire to recharge an EV in the same time it takes to fill up a car. That's a, that's mm -hmm. obviously the, what we're shooting for. But I also right. think that the driver of the EVs is going to be very different. They're not going to wait until they're at a quarter tank, so to speak, to refuel. Yep. They're going to refuel and recharge every chance they get. Is that kind of the same mentality you're seeing in your surveys? Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I, I liken it to, you know, charging up our our cell phone before you get on right? you know, right? I plug my I plug it in <laughs> at the end of the night and I wake up in the morning and it's fully charged. And you know, I always tell people that um, you know, I I, I drive a nice vehicle. I don't fill up my gas tank every day. I don't, you know, go from zero to 100 every day. And it's the same way with EVs. You're not charging from zero to 100 every time you charge. You're using a little bit of your, your battery life and then you top it off or you plug it in at night or you top it off around town. So, you know, this whole mentality of needing to charge from zero to 100 every time you charge is not realistic. And I think that's part of the problem that we, we've seen with our our data, regardless of the study we have, there's a lack of awareness and information around EVs and the reality of owning one and what consumers can expect from, from owning those vehicles, because you hit on a very big one. And that's, you know, the fact that people aren't charging all that frequently from zero to 100. And so it's a very different. But behavior. there's times when I'll put my, I have a, a wireless charger for my phone. I'll put my phone on there. When I go to bed, wake up in the morning, it didn't charge. Same thing with a car. Mm -hmm. What if you forget to plug it in? You need to have a place you can go and get the miles you need yeah. to get to where you're going. It's it, you, So you need that backstop. Yeah. And I talked to some utilities that go, we really want them to charge at night. Yeah, I understand that. But they're not going to charge at night. They're not going to mm -hmm. buy the EV unless they know that if they have to charge at 2 o'clock in the afternoon, they can. And we need to make sure that yeah. that is fundamentally available for them. Yeah, it's a safety net. It really is. You know, having having that infrastructure and the ability to charge when and where needed, um, you know, is really a safety net for EV owners. Um, you know, when we look at consideration and, um, you know, we talk about some of these barriers to consideration for electric vehicle um, uh, purchasers, you know, that's that's one of the big ones. Um, you know, it's it's the peace of mind knowing that you can charge it when you want to charge it. If but you, you also mentioned to. consumer awareness, and I think that's something that's being completely underestimated. So I have a plug-in hybrid and I said, it's the Wrangler. So it gets 25 mm -hmm. miles range on a full charge. I posted on a Jeep site. Hey, I got this pretty cool. Somebody asked, what's your range? I told them, I said, but right now I'm on a level one charger at my house. It's taking 14 hours to recharge it. So I'm going to get a level two. So it charges faster. Mm -hmm. One of the questions was, when you get a faster charger, will you get longer range? Now, for those of us in the industry, it's like, <laughs> that is just a ridiculous question. But that's reality. People out there don't understand. When you it think is. about, you know, 85% of the registered EVs are found in 15 states in the U.S. right now. I mean, there's a lack of awareness. Yeah. I think we're not really appreciating what it's going to take to get people to recognize what the te technology is. 
Yeah, absolutely. You know, we have a lot of conversations with vehicle manufacturers and, and, you know, one of the big topics of conversation is, you know, they're obviously investing a lot of money into building these types of products and, and hoping that the consumers will be there. The interest will be there for those, those products. Um, but you know, the, the interest will change when the awareness changes. So, you know, we're doing everything we can to get the word out about um, electric vehicles, what they are and, you know, how, how, uh, you know, you know, people live with these on a, um, you know, daily basis and how it affects their lives and, you know, the benefits and, and, you know, some of the, you know, I wouldn't say drawbacks, but some of the um, you know, changes in behavior that um, you have to make when you own an electric vehicle. It really is an awareness and, um, you know, an information campaign, really, that, uh, you know, that everyone you know, needs There's some to communities do. that have never seen an EV. And I, I engage with some people who think yep. EVs are still just a fantasy, a unicorn or a fad. And I try to remind them, look, just because you haven't seen them or you don't understand it doesn't mean it's a fad. Remember, in the 50s, they thought rock and roll was a fad. And what happened? It didn't go away. I don't think EVs are going away. I am of the mindset mm -hmm. that EVs are going to be like rock and roll. They're going to be part of the bigger equation. I don't think they're going to be the only mm -hmm. music, the only vehicle in the market, but they're going to have a major, major role in our transportation market. And we need to start preparing for that. And I think, you know, if we don't keep our eyes open and look at all the different avenues that are required to make a transition to something new, we're going to miss the ball and we're going to struggle and it's going to be really painful. Absolutely. Yeah. You know, we've, we've talked with a lot of utility companies about preparing, um, you know, their markets for EVs. I think EVs, you're right, will be, you know, part of the, the, the big picture. You know, there's other technologies I think that will, um, you know, come uh, into play, you know, fuel cell vehicles, I think will have some relevance. Um, and, you know, ICE vehicles aren't going away anytime soon. You know, they'll still be relevant for the foreseeable future. You know, there are differences in the limitations and benefits of each technology. And um, I think each has its merits. And, you know, as long as they do, we'll see each of those for the foreseeable future. But EVs aren't going anywhere. You're right. You know, someone asked me the other day um, if I thought EVs would uh, would, would take off, if, they, if it was going to stick. And I said, look, you know, the train has left the station. The amount of money that manufacturers have invested in this space, you know, we're past the point of no return. It, it, it needs to be successful, you know, so everyone's going to do their part to ensure that uh, it is successful because it is the future. And, you know, you're right. There are a lot of you know municipalities and states and um, utility companies who need to better yeah, there's prepare a, for that. There's definitely a lack of preparation out there. But to your point, we have time. You know, even if we get to a, a significant s a share of sales by 2030, 2035, the transition of 255, 260 million light duty vehicles, something new is going to take decades. Um, so we have time to plan, but we need to start planning now because otherwise the train has left the station, but we're kind of building the tracks as it's rolling down the road. Mm -hmm. And that's a little scary. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, you know, I, I use this analogy to kind of put things in perspective with the growth of EVs. So, you know, really things kind of started with, um, you know, in a mass quantity with Tesla. You know, when Tesla introduced their products, that's when things really started to take off. Obviously, there were electric vehicles prior to Tesla, but that's really when it started to gain some share. So, you know, Tesla released their, their products, I think, about 12 years ago or so. So, you know, roughly within a decade span, you went from almost a non-existent market share for electric electric vehicles to 2% of US retail sales. So in about 10 year span, we went from zero to 2%. From We, we ended up at 2% at the end of 2020. Halfway through 2021, right. we went from 2% to 3%. So that one percentage point gain in market share may seem small, but that's a really considerable jump in a six month span, considering it took us 10 plus years to get to 2%. So I think we're starting to hit that uh, that curve. You're going to, you know, you, you mentioned, um, you know, Choice was one of those three C's, and you know that's really driving a lot of this. There's a lot of products coming to market now, SUVs, pickup trucks, that resonate with American consumers that are going to help with EV adoption. And uh, I do think that you know we're at three percent now, but it's going to accelerate pretty quickly. And you know we've got some time, but not yeah, a lot of the sales time curve in reality. The stick is starting to curve up, and I think it's yeah. a combination of factors: one, the choice of vehicles. 
the cost is coming down. But I think the consumer mindset is changing too. And the, the buyer demographic is changing. You know, the buyers that are in generation behind me will think, why would I not plug in my car? I plug in everything anyway. I'm more, why would I want to plug in my car? I, I've never plugged in my car. I don't know if I want to do that. That mindset is going to change. And I think that is going to help that acceleration of the hockey stick. But the reality is from the boots on the ground, no matter how fast we sell them, we have to replace what's in the market. And that's just going to take a long time, which gives us the, the on-ramp to get everything right. set up that we need to get set up. It is. Yeah. 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 And, and, you know, that was really um, the impetus for developing the studies that we we did. It was, you know, trying to get out in front of this as much as we can, recognizing that <clears throat> stakeholders, EV stakeholders have an opportunity to make course correction or, you know, um, you know, make some substantial um, investments or changes prior to that um, mass market adoption. So getting out in front of it was really important for us and having the information to help manufacturers do that. Now, I pr appreciate you joining us today. Where can people go to get more information on the studies you guys have been doing? So jdpower.com, uh, our corporate website, has all the information on there, press releases and uh, additional information about the studies. Well, Brent, thank you very much for joining us. I love what JD Power is doing, and I look forward to paying attention to your research as you guys go forward. And for all of you guys at home, thanks for tuning in Carpool Chats. We'll see you next time. Have a good one.